name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for this time to come together and to study the teachings of St. John Paul II in the Theology of the Body. We ask you to send your Holy Spirit, Lord, to be with us. Help us to understand these teachings uh, to the best of our ability. Lord, send your Holy Spirit to enlighten our minds and hearts. Um, also, that we can live these teachings out in our lives and share them with others. Uh, we thank you for the gift of St. John Paul II to the church and his legacy that he's left us. As the uh, first reading from Mass this morning told us about the legacy that that virtuous people leave behind them. So we thank you, Lord, for the gift of John Paul II and, um, and this theology of the body. We ask all this through Christ our Lord. Amen. St. John Paul II. Pray for us. St. Joseph. Pray for us. Our Lady of Guadalupe. Pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. So I will share my screen. And we will jump into audience number 94. Um, so we are... We are in the second part of Theology of the Body. Theology of the Body is made into two main parts. The first part uh, could be called an adequate anthropology, looking at what does it mean when scripture says God made them male and female in his image. Um, so what does it mean to be made in the image of God? And we, in the first part, this adequate anthropology of the theology of the body, we looked at our origin, our history, and our destiny. And these three phases of our anthropology, of what it means to be human, of what the theology of the body, what does scripture say about the meaning of the human body? What does God's word reveal about the human body, what it means to be human? This is, this is in part one. Um, and those three phases are all based on the words of Christ. Uh, the, the triptych of Christ's words, when Christ appeals to the beginning, when Christ appeals to the human heart, which is our history, and when Christ appeals to the future resurrection, to the resurrection of the body that we believe as Catholics um, and Christians. So uh, this, this is part one. And now we've moved to part two, um, which is an analysis of the sacrament. So it's called the sacrament. And in both parts of this massive catechesis by St. John Paul II um, are split into three chapters. So I just explained the, the three chapters of part one. And the three chapters of part two, we're still in chapter one of part two. Um, we're looking at the sacrament, the sacrament of marriage. Um, so we're looking at the sacrament of marriage in two different ways. This first way, we're, we're taking um, the letter of St. Paul to the Ephesians, uh, specifically chapter 5, verses 21 through 33 or 22 through 33. Um, and this, th these are the verses where St. John Paul II is specifically focusing on. Uh, because it reveals so much about marriage, and it reveals so much about Christ and the church. Um, and then later on, we'll look at marriage under another aspect, the aspect of sign. What does it mean that marriage is a sign? Um, and then the final chapter of part two is an analysis of the document Humanae Vitae by Pope Paul VI which confirmed the church's teaching on human life and rejected contraception. Um, so that's where we're headed, but now we're, we're still in the first chapter of part two. And we're, we're looking at this letter of Ephesians, letter of St. Paul to the Ephesians, and what does this whole letter speak about? Well, at the beginning of the letter to the Ephesians, it speaks about this mystery hidden in, from ages in God, this eternal mystery of God which we know God is a Trinity and he's existed as a Trinity from all eternity, father, son, and Holy spirit, uh, pouring himself out in love, but in an eternal exchange of love, as the catechism says, an exchange of love, um, between father, son, and Holy spirit. And he has destined us humans, his creatures to share in that exchange. So, God created us out of love as a free gift. He had no need 
God was completely happy and perfect in himself from all eternity, but he created the world. He created as a gratuitous gift, as a gift to us. And so Ephesians speaks about this gift, that this mystery hidden in ages from God was destined as a gift for us, for you, um, from all eternity. And so we see over salvation history are from God existing in eternity to the creation of the world and the unfolding of his plan um, through Christ and in Christ, uh, this mystery comes about, this plan of salvation. We experience in Christ, we receive this gift and this gift of redemption, which is through, through Christ's cross and resurrection, uh, we encounter, we experience the grace of this um, redemption. And now as Catholics, we believe we, we receive this grace through the sacraments, uh, through baptism, through the Eucharist, through all the sacraments, through marriage. Um, so in its content as a whole, beginning with the first chapter, the letter treats above all the mystery hidden from ages in God as a gift eternally destined for man. And this is what scripture says. Uh, this is from Ephesians. The gift destined for him from ages in Christ became a real part of man in the same Christ. And then here starts the scripture. In whom we have the redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. He has abundantly poured it out on us with all wisdom and insight because he has made known to us the mystery of his will according to the design that in his benevolence he had pre-established in him to realize it in the fullness of time, the plan of gathering up all things in him as head, those in heaven and those on earth. So uh, Bill Donahue in his video explanation of, of this audience spoke about these verses of scripture in reference to marriage, that God wants to marry us, that Christ is the bridegroom. Jesus is the bridegroom. Um, and so when we look at these verses, um, the mystery of his will, he made known his will, which we realize is that God wants this intimate, loving, personal relationship with us. Um, and at the end here, it says the fullness of time. We know that Christ came in the fullness of time. This is called the fullness of time when Jesus came. Um and gathering all things in him as head, those in heaven and those on earth. So this, this culmination of God's plan, this, is, this recalls this eschatological perspective or the, the time, the end time that we discussed in chapter three of part one, um, that when everything will be fulfilled. Okay, so the eternal mystery has passed from the state of hiddenness in God to the, to the phase of revelation and realization. So there's two phases here. There's this phase where this eternal mystery is hidden in God. And, and at a certain point in history, in the fullness of time, it's revealed and realized. So, you know, throughout the history of the Old Testament, the people of God, the Israelites, did not have the fullness of revelation yet. They, they had some revelation of God, you know, to Abraham, to through the scriptures, um, through the prophets. They were learning more and more. God was revealing himself through the prophets and in various ways, as the letter to the Hebrews says, epistle to the Hebrews. But in the fullness of time, God spoke to us through his son. God spoke through Jesus. And this is the, the fullest revelation. So this, this is the full revelation I mean, through, through Christ. Okay, and then after talking about this in the letter to the Ephesians, uh, this mystery hidden in God and its, and its revelation or realization in time through Christ, um, the author seems to speak about the moral aspects of the vocation of Christians, how we're to live, what's right and wrong, what are our choices. And he specifically then speaks about marriage, the moral life of husband and wife. They're called to be submissive to one another, to serve one another in the fear of Christ. 
are referring back to the mystery that is always at work in them in virtue of the redemption of Christ, and that works with efficaciousness, above all, in virtue of baptism. So the moral life, living a holy life, choosing good actions, stems from our participation in Christ, through our participation in this mystery. We can't do good works, our serve, our love, people, without being connected to the vine, without being connected to Christ. Uh, good works flow from love. It flows from love, which is a gift of God in the Holy Spirit. It's not from ourselves. So God gets all the glory. At the center of the mystery is Christ. So both this mystery that is hidden in God from all eternity, this is Christ. Christ existed. The second person of the, of the Blessed Trinity existed before time began from all eternity. The Trinity has existed. And the center of this mystery as it's revealed and as the plan of God is accomplished in human history, this is also in Christ through Christ, because at the incarnation, the word of God became flesh. God dwelt among us in the person of Christ. Um, and, and this is the accomplishment of this mystery. And now through the church, through the sacraments, Christ is, is the center. According to Ephesians 5, 22 through 23, the supernatural gift of the fruits of redemption accomplished by Christ gains the features of a spousal gift of self by Christ himself to the church, according to the likeness of the spousal relationship between husband and wife. So this is what Ephesians 5 uh, adds to this situation that we're discussing, that this uh, plan of God is actually a spousal plan of God, that that Christ's gift of redemption, that this mystery that is hidden from God in eternity and revealed to man, this is actually a spousal mystery that Christ gives himself to the church in a, just as husband and wife give themselves to each other. This is the great analogy that's in Ephesians 5. Um, so then we're talking about this spousal analogy, this uh, referring to this mystery in terms of husband and wife. Um, we must raise the question whether at this point the analogy does not allow us to penetrate more deeply and with greater precision into the essential content of the mystery. So does this analogy help us? This is the question. Does this spousal, does this spousal analogy um, help us to penetrate into this mystery, help us to understand this mystery? And I think the answer is yes, <laughs> it does help us because uh, John Paul II says another time that this is the least inadequate analogy. So there are many analogies that we can use that in every analogy is inadequate in some way. You know, we can, we can speak of Christ as the good shepherd. We can speak of Christ as the vine and we are the branches. Um, but the, in describing this uh, mystery of God that uh, has existed from eternity and been revealed and accomplished, uh, the spousal analogy is the least inadequate. Um, okay, and but Saint Paul in the Ephesians is not the first is not the first to speak of the spousal analogy in reference to God and His Church and to God and His people. But this spousal analogy has been used throughout the Old Testament by the prophets. Yet at the basis of all these statements of the prophets stands the explicit conviction that the love of Yahweh for the chosen people can and must be compared to the love that unites bride and bridegroom, the love that should unite spouses. It will be good to quote many passages from Isaiah, Hosea, and Ezekiel. So we talked about this in, in uh, part one, about in chapter two, about uh, these prophets speaking of the people of Israel that committed adultery <laughs> with God through their idolatry, through turning to other gods. This was an act of adultery where they were called to have this monogamous, this one-on-one -on -one relationship with God as their God. Um, but in all of these texts that speak of Israel turning away from God and the consequences of this, 
there, there's this theme of the love of God, the bridegroom. This theme of the love of God, the bridegroom runs throughout this. God as the bridegroom of his people. For your creator is your husband. Lord of hosts is his name. The Holy One of Israel is your Redeemer, the God of the whole earth he is called. For like a wife forsaken and grieved in spirit, the Lord has called you. So this is the text that John Paul II quotes at the end of this audience that we're going to look at next time. There's more verses. I just pulled out a few, but um, this is from Isaiah chapter 54, where we see that our creator is, is your husband. Okay, before our discussion, I have a few announcements. Please keep us in prayer. There's a Theology of the Body retreat happening Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Um, and then the Theology of the Body retreat in Mexico City is coming up. Uh, so if you know of anybody interested, you can still come uh, or they can still come. And then we're looking forward to August in Vienna. If you know of anybody in the area or you want to make a flight to Vienna to join us. Um, theology of the Body Retreat there with discussions and seeing some, some beautiful places in Vienna. Okay, and if you'd like to join us for prayer, we meet every night at 9 p.m. Central Time on Zoom and 3 p.m. Central Time for the Divine Mercy Chaplet. So you have to translate that time into your time zone. And if you'd like to support the, the mission, the, this mission of spreading the teachings of uh, St. John Paul II and the theology of the body, you can through prayer uh, or financially. All right. So um, what are your thoughts and um, what would you like to talk about in terms of, of this audience today? Number 94. Oh yeah, go for it, Lily. Just feel free to feel free to speak up. Anybody's welcome. Hi, Nicholas. Thank you. So um, I heard you mention Pope Paul the Sixth and something regarding contraception. Could you speak mm -hmm. more about that? Yeah. Um, so Pope Paul the Sixth, Pope Saint Paul the Sixth. He's a saint too. Um, he. Uh, was Pope a few popes before John Paul II. He, he wrote the encyclical um, Humanae Vitae. So there was Pope John XXIII who opened Vatican Council II. And then there after him was Pope Paul VI who closed Second Vatican II, Second Vatican Council. Um, and so there's John and Paul. And then after Paul VI, there was a, a pope named Pope John Paul I, and he was pope for a month. But his name was from John and Paul. So he, like both of these two prior popes, uh, John and Paul. And then um, after that month, then uh, he died and they elected uh, Pope John Karol Wojtyla from Poland, which had, uh, they hadn't elected a, a pope outside of Italy, outside of Italy for a long, long time, hundreds of years. But this uh, Cardinal Wojtyla from Poland uh, was elected Pope. And he took the name as his immediate predecessor, John Paul, which is after John and Paul. So pa John Paul II. Anyway, um, there was this document after Vatican II that Paul VI, St. Paul VI wrote, um, called, it's an encyclical, which is one of the highest, almost one of the highest authority, you know, Vatican II is, there's different levels of authority of documents of the church. 
Um, so obviously the council would be like the highest, I guess, the magisterial teaching. Um, but then there's encyclicals. And so it's a very high authority and this is called Humane Vitae. And in that document, it's really short. You can read it probably really easily. Um, and it, it confirms the teaching of the church on contraception. Um, prior to writing this document, Pope Paul VI asked for theologians to put their input on the question of contraception. Should there in the church, there was this dialogue at that time, should contraception be allowed? And so there were bishops and theologians on either side arguing, yes, contraception should be allowed. And some arguing, no, contraception should not be allowed. So they both submitted a document with reasons. And the, the majority actually said, oh, we should allow contraception. The minority said, no, it's the tradition of the church. And for these reasons, we should not allow contraception. So Paul VI looked at both of these answers. He prayed about it and he delivered his magisterial teaching. And as Catholics, we believe that the Holy Father is guided by the Holy Spirit and, and the church is guided by the Holy Spirit to remain in the truth. Um, and so Paul VI gave us the official church teaching that contraception is not okay. Um, and he, he described the many consequences, negative damaging effects that contraception would have on marriages, on women, um, if, it's, if it was adopted by society. And then as history has gone on since 1968, when this document was published, we have seen these, these consequences come true. Uh, contraception has not helped marriages, as some would argue, uh, but has actually hurt relationships. It causes spouses to use one another. Um, and so this is what the theology of the body is, is a foundational argument um, going to the roots of marriage and family, looking at the meaning of male and female to give an adequate basis and adequate reasoning for understanding humane vitae, for understanding the church's teaching on why contraception is not okay. Um, and this is, so this is why the last chapter of Theology of the Body is about humane vitae and tying together how all that we've looked at so far, what scripture reveals about the human person, about love, um, this confirms what Paul VI said in that document. Nick, I think in uh, the advisory body that you were referring to, for if I'm thinking the same thing, it really was more lay people and such, uh, doctors and, and different people like that, and oh. such who were, uh, and, and they actually went behind uh, uh, Paul VI back and uh, revealed that they were a majority uh, advising for the change. And so the reception of that uh, encyclical was um, received poorly, partially because so many people had anticipated that there was going to be a change. But uh, thanks for all the, the rest of the context you gave. That was good. Oh, thanks, Ed. Thanks for Nick, if, if you can clarify, that, that whole issue dealt with um, let's call it unnatural contraception, right? Because the church's stand on natural family planning is that it is not contraception and is therefore okay, correct? So, yeah, the in Humane Vitae, in Humane Vitae, Paul VI said that every act of sexual intercourse between husband and, and wife must, uh, it has two meanings. Every act of sexual intercourse has two meanings, the procreative meaning and the unitive meaning. And both of these meanings must be intact in every act of conjugal, of conjugal intercourse. So um, this means a, a couple by their own outside choices cannot make sterile an act that is supposed to be open to life, um, that we cannot make this act infertile through an artificial addition, through an artificial addition of contraception, through a pill, through a surgery, through condom, any way that contraception from the outside. Now, there are a, there is a rhythm to the woman's body. 
um, that there's certain times that a woman is infertile, meaning if, if a uh, couple participates in the conjugal act during this time, there's a, a high likelihood that they will not become pregnant. Um, and there's, there's an institute in Omaha, Nebraska, the, is it the Paul VI Institute that studies this and counsels women how to chart and how to be aware of their fertile time and infertile time. Um, and this is called natural family planning that if a couple has a legitimate reason to not not be able to give birth to a child for some reason, maybe they're, whatever those reasons are that they've discerned that, um, then, then they can refer to this, um, the church allows them to do this. Um, however, the church also calls parents to be generous and uh, to that is actually God's blessing on a large family. Um, so, and the scripture speaks so highly of children and having many children, like it's, it's a blessing, a sign of blessing from God. Um, but if a couple for various reasons that they have discerned that they cannot have a baby, maybe it's like psych like they're just too distraught or something that they can't give, you know, but like, or financially they can't for afford a child. I don't know. There's different reasons that they would consider in their discernment that they should probably make with their pastor and with others to help them discern, um, that, uh, that this would be a reason to only partake in the conjugal act during the infertile times. Um, but this, this natural family planning takes a lot of communication and it actually helps their relationship uh, because they actually have to have times of continence or times of abstinence from the conjugal act. So it, it increases their self-control, um, their communication. So there's many positive and uh, I probably, Nick would have, uh, uh, Nick Grant, I would have uh, thought that the two things that we're talking about would be contraception, but there is nothing in the act of when, when you're uh, using uh, natural family planning that's preventing contraception. It's just using an awareness of when the female body um, is most likely to uh, be able to uh, conceive. And so you're not contracepting in any way, way, you're just taking advantage of awareness of when what's going on with the woman's body. Lily, feel free to speak in whenever you want. Yeah. yeah thank you. So that was amazing um, commentary. Um, so I just had two thoughts. Um, natural family planning was one of them because I still never had the chance to look at it and, and like make my own, do my own research. And also I haven't read much about theology of the body. All of this is new to me um, because I, I um, was part of Society St. Pius X and much of it is kind of rejected in a way. Um, but ever since uh, like this year has been a total blessing for me, I've met a lot of wonderful Catholic friends who has helped me um, look into it more. Um, just um, um, just pray about these things. Um, so with natural family planning, I was actually in another Zoom class last week listening to a good uh, Catholic priest talk about it. And he said that the man's job, not job, but like is to give love and the woman is to receive that love. Um, and my question or, or kind of like thoughts about it, um, like, like if a woman has health issues, do, does the couple go like become celibate for the remainder of their marriage or like, like issues like that? And I don't know, it's just kind of, it's, it's really confusing in a way to me. I don't know if you could just like speak about that more. I mean, maybe someone else can uh, speak better than me like um, on this call too, but I was just thinking like if the wife is sick or something or one of either one of them is sick and they're not feeling well, it would be charitable it seems to not partake in that act if, if you know, like they're not feeling well. Um, if 
a wife or husband is sick for their whole the rest of their marriage that's a really sad situation um but i think yeah what so that that would be an extreme example i think um that probably wouldn't happen most of the time it wouldn't be common but if that does happen it's really sad um so i would yeah, just out of charity, they're always called to have charity towards one another, um, husband and wife. So whatever is best for the other person. It, it, I, my understanding is it would be their choice still. If, um, if they wanted to go ahead and try to have children, even if it's a risk to the wife, then that's something they could do, and yet uh, in no way do they have to, and they could choose uh, to be celibate under those circumstances. Uh, they could use the natural family planning as, as best they could, um, which you know is as effective nowadays as uh, any kind of contraceptive me method other than uh, abortion, so. But as Nick mentioned, that's very, very tough. And it's a huge cross that uh, someone would bear under circumstances like that. And also just touching upon um, like, like the vocation of marriage. Um, like motherhood isn't just um, like having your own children. Like marriage is a union and you're, you're both helping each other get to heaven and children is just a blessing from that union, from God. Um, like for example, if the husband or wife doesn't have the ability, like they have fertility problems or other health issues, you can be a parent and adopt children. That's another way of like a charitable act or there's so many other ways that we can, can like fulfill our vocation in marriage. Um, Lily, if you would have joined us earlier, um, John Paul goes in great detail about spiritual motherhood and fatherhood. And so um, whether you're single, are married, are in uh, consecrated life, you can express um, your uh, fatherhood or motherhood in a, in a spiritual fashion by things that you would do. Yes, that's very beautiful. Mm -hmm. What about anything from, um, those are great questions. Thank you for bringing it up. I don't mean to change the topic if if anyone wants to say anything else on that topic. Um, but like today in the audience, we were reminded again of um, this image of, of God's love for his people as a spousal relationship, that God is our the bridegroom of the church. Um, and this is realized through Christ and, and St. Paul speaks about it in the letter to the Ephesians. Um, do you have any thoughts about this? <laughs> one, one thing I was thinking just real quick that is often used by people who've studied TOB is the similarity in, in analogy between um, Christ the bridegroom and uh, the church his bride and between the married couple in that what takes place has to be uh, a gift that is total, free, fruitful, and faithful. And then a lot of what we look at in terms of uh, contraception is that it is purposely blocking the, uh, the fruitful in the act of, uh, of uh, sexual intercourse. But uh, just the, the beauty of, of, of why 
one would approach marriage in such a way and approach love in such a way is that it is a reflection on what Christ did on the cross for us. I think, um, sorry, is that okay? Yeah, I, I think that's one, one of the things that's so beautiful about the way the Pope approaches this is he is inviting us to just look um, at all of this um, before he starts talking about the rules, <laughs> you know, um, because uh, as, if I'm not mistaken, um, Pope St. Paul VI asked him to expound upon the, the why of humane vitae. I mean, did we talk about that already? Or did you mention that, Nick? Um, uh, but, you yes. know, the why behind the, the what. And, um, you know, he does this, like inviting us into this, this whole concept of what it, what it means to be human and then goes into how what, how do we live in a way that will make us happy? Um, but it just, um, I mean, he gets so excited about Ephesians 5. <laughs> Ephesians 5. <laughs> and, you know, it's so um, just pondering this and pondering, um, pondering it in the concept of the, the entire gospel and um, the relationship of us to the bridegroom as the church, you know, it's just so deep. And um, it's, if people can, can just kind of enter into just a teeny tiny bit of it and realize just, you know, if each, if each married couple could just, um, just think, I don't think people are thinking when they get married. I mean, at least we weren't, um, nobody even talked about any of these concepts to us before my husband and I got married, but um, it's, I think the Holy Spirit, you know, just getting a little, little crack in the door there and just realize what, what you're doing in renewing your um, marital vows each and every time um, there's intercourse and just, it's like, wow, you know, and it's meant to be unitive and meant to be procreative -cre -pro and um, meant to be charitable, like you said. Um, whew, I mean, it's, <laughs> it's, it's really mind blowing, you know, to, and to make um, Ephesians 5 part of your, um, part of something that enters into your heart. You know, his word does not return void. I mean, it's, um, it's just something that um, I think could transform your life. And I, th I think this is what, um, what's the Pope's intention to just, to just start in and um, bring it into people's hearts. I, I don't know what people think about that, but that's, that's just what I'm thinking. So. Yeah. That was beautiful, Mary. Um, I just wanted to confirm what you said about um, having the why behind the what. So we have we have rules, right, in life, in our church, in society. Like th the speed limit is this, or don't uh, steal from the grocery store, or um, or don't use contraception or don't get divorced, <laughs> um, things like they're, they're rules, but there's always a reason. There's a good reason for them. There should be, <laughs> always, there should be a good reason for the rules. And so um, they're protecting something good, protecting a value, you know, don't steal because those belong to those workers in the store and they need it for their sustenance and whatnot. Um, and so what John Paul II is doing here in the theology of the body, he's, he's giving us the whole picture, the whole worldview to see why con this church teaching on procreation makes sense on where, how it fits in. What, what's the why behind the, the what? Yeah. So I just can I just agree. Nick, I've got a, a couple of comments in this audience. Mm -hmm. I, I found it fascinating. You used the term that, um, 
the, the Pope said this was the least inadequate thing he could come up with to describe it. But when he does that flow from God who created mankind in his image, and then there was the fall. And so then he talks about actually Yahweh through Abraham created Israel and his chosen people who were still stained with original sin. Then he sends his son, Jesus Christ, to give the gift of salvation to all, not just the chosen, to all. And those who accept it are now this, this bridegroom. But when you use the term church in that sentence, who, who is the church? Is it not everyone? Is it just Christians? Is it just Catholics? Is it just good Catholics? And that causes, in my mind, a real issue with what is the Pope really trying to say here? And we, we have to be real. And, and I'm not saying this is right, but 60% of Catholics get divorced. 80 to 90% of Catholic women use contraception and virtually no Catholics use natural family planning because it is too unsure. And I would argue that natural family planning is just a mental versus artificial form of contraception because the reason you're doing it is to not procreate. And Humana Vita said, conjugal love should always have two elements, one of which is procreation. So all of this gets to the point that if we're not careful as Catholics, we look like we're a total dub double speak organization because we say one thing and do another. We're hypocritical. And even in some of these words, if we're not careful, we'll be looked at as those who exclude as opposed to include. If I can respond first to the, um, yeah, th thanks for sharing, Nick. Um, for, first to the, what, who is the church, right? Um, in, in my understanding, you know, there's, there's definitely a lot of writing on the church and what is the church and the catechism has a lot to say. Um, my understanding is that to become a part of the church, you have to be baptized and receive the sacraments. And this is sort of your initiation into the church. Um, and you can become, you know, through confirmation, through receiving the Eucharist, uh, a part of the Catholic church which the term Catholic means universal. It's, it's over the whole world. We believe it's, it's God's church, that Christ founded this church on the apostles um, down through the centuries. Um, now, everyone, God has this desire, this love for every single person, and he wants everyone to come to knowledge of the truth and to be saved. So he has this, this desire, this love for every single person. Um, however, not every single person will choose because God also gave us free will, um, to enter into that covenant relationship with God. Um, some people choose to turn away. Um, and some people like in some parts of the world have not even heard the gospel. They haven't even heard about Christ. Um, so we believe God is not bound by his sacraments. God is not bound by the normal ordinary means he set up. So yes, God set up the church and he set up the sacraments by which we're saved, by which we receive grace, but he's also free to give grace in any way he chooses. So if, if someone is not blessed by Christian missionaries to proclaim the gospel, God is still free to, you know, God is the ultimate judge of all of us at the end of our life. So if that person that never heard the gospel was seeking the truth sincerely, I, I cannot judge what Christ, how Christ will judge is, is up to God and his mercy and his mercy. But we know that in heaven, there is the teaching of the church. So there is the Trinity. It is the Christian, it is Christian heaven, right? <laughs> so if you're a member of another religion, the heaven is and objective reality, the God is there. Um, so if, if they enter heaven, they will have accepted Christ. 
right? And the church. So. And in Lumen Gentia, it mentions that the church subsists in the Roman Catholic Church. And so there is the idea that the church is, is larger just than the Roman Catholic and, and all baptized. Yet one of the uh, heresies that seems to be existing right now is a sort of universalism that everyone will be saved. And so therefore, it's probably weakened how um, bishops and priests have preached to their people about the necessity of staying within the uh, requirements of the church. It's also weakened our uh, desire to go out and spread the gospel to those who don't hear it. And these are our major flaws in our time. And then the, any other thoughts or the other issue about Nick, you brought up about is natural family planning just another form of contraception? You know, that's a big, um, <laughs> a big question. And I think um, a couple could use it in that mindset that they're just like, okay, we just don't want to have children. We're, we're just going to not have any children and we're just going to use natural family planning. And that would not be okay because the church teaches that we're called to be generous and there's there can only discern not to have children for a legitimate reason. Like part of the purpose of marriage is to procreate, right? That's one of the purposes. There's not, it's not the only purpose. The other purposes are the unity of the couple, their stability and their sanctification that they become holy. This is the other purpose of marriage. Um, but procreation is one of those purposes. <laughs> like, God told us to be fruitful and multiply. It's a command of God in Genesis um, to be fruitful. And so if a couple just doesn't want to be fruitful, then that is not, uh, that's not using marriage as it's meant to be. But, um, but there is a difference. There is a difference in, in natural family planning and artificial contraception. Um, because there's a, there's a big difference because natural family planning respects the way that God designed our bodies. It use, it use, is using our bodies as God designed according, completely according to how he, he made them. Um, while contraception is taking something artificial from the outside and putting that into the conjugal relationship. Nick and, Nick and Mary, uh, Nick Grant, that is, um, might remember a bit of how uh, things were after uh, the uh, contraception uh, or humanity vitae came out. There was a, a whole rebellion with even within the church, and there were uh, people even teaching in Rome and questioning it and such. And so... Um, God, it's only only in God's judgment how those people who uh, um, continued this rebellion uh, fit in. And then the priests who studied under those situations um, would often just give the advice to use your own conscience instead of uh, a, a deeper instruction. And so it, it, there's just been a, a huge huge consequence to all that in terms of how the faithful somewhat uh, unwittingly and somewhat without uh, looking into it in depth probably as to uh, how to answer the question might have taken the, uh, the easy approach hearing what they wanted to hear out of the confusion um, um, made choices and, and really there um, as George Weigel said, this uh, theology of the body is a, is a time bomb because it, it's the corrective one. In, in you know, just what Mary said, if we, if we can get young people to the point when they get ready to get married and get 
don't get too fouled up by the sexual revolution and porn and all those kinds of things, but just meditate on what real Ephesians 5 is. But even now, since there's a choice in readings when that part of Ephesians 5 comes up um, in the liturgy, so many priests avoid preaching on it because they don't have the handle and knowledge that um, theology of the body has given us in terms of understanding um, that part of Ephesians. So there, there's a lot to take place yet, but it's not totally a, a unheard of as far as uh, real turmoil after, uh, after councils and with the social media and such that has existed after this, seems like uh, the confusion got even deeper. Those are all very good points, Ed. Um, I would just say like, because like I'm still in my twenties and I've also gr grown up in the traditional Latin rite um, just like with the youth and the whole like se sexual revolution and, and all that stuff, I'd say there isn't much um, teaching surrounding like theology of the body, like some groups within in the church, like very like legalistic uh, mindset. They, they kind of like in a way reject some of the, the post Vatican II teachings, but I actually think like it, it was a blessing totally to for me to be open to learning about all this and it, it's actually answering a lot of my questions that I've had like priests some priests are are not open to discussing it it's like it's like a topic that is too difficult to talk about but like for my generation desperately needs people to be open and willing to listen and talk about these difficult subjects and uh, honestly I found a lot of healing um just like reading about it and um, like our generation, with, like you said, with all of the, their struggles now with social media and stuff, um, it's desperately needed for sure. Hey, um, I had a question. Uh, I, I had to jump on a phone call, so I, I had to uh, zone out just for a few minutes. Did you did you guys talk about, as per Nick Grant's question uh, regarding um, uh, natural family planning be a type, being a type of uh, intellectual or you could say natural contraception? Did you guys talk about that? Because I, I was curious about how is NFP morally uh, morally, yeah, morally and thus spiritually different from, um, you know, coitus interruptus from, from, um, you know, with, uh, from withdrawing. How, how is that, how is that different? Because obviously that, that is a form of contraception and that is condemned, I believe, uh, directly in that encyclical humane vitae. Um, but obviously natural family planning is, is not, even though some might, you know, some might term it as a form of natural contraception. So, I, if anybody has a thought on that, it's like, what's the big difference between, say, NFP is not being natural contraception, whereas uh, coitus interruptus would be like natural contraception, thus bad. Mm -hmm. Well, natural family planning is is just about timing. It's using it's using the the conjugal act completely normal, but it's just about when they do it. Um, any other form of contraception is changing something about the, the conjugal act. So the coitus interrupt this thing, that's not doing the conjugal act as it's meant to be. Uh, condom, pill, anything is changing something about the conjugal act. So natural family planning doesn't change anything about the conjugal act. It just chooses when they partake, partake of it. Well, in and Nick uh, Koppel also mentioned that it's always in the context of uh, a special set of circumstances where um, having a child at that time is difficult. It's not used um, with the intention of uh, just not having children. So it, it's to be used exceptionally and uh, it doesn't inter interfere with the integrity of the act. It's just taking a advantage of an awareness and the people are open to receiving a child under those circumstances 
if it does fail. But, you know, it, it's a challenge because people who want to uh, will see it as no different than uh, contraception. But uh, I think it's just an acceptance of there are very challenging times. And now that we understand the female body as it um, functions in the uh, sexual act the way it is, that uh, people can um, plan accordingly under exceptional circumstances without choosing to artificially um, prevent the, uh, or uh, to, to attack the integrity of the act. I, I don't know if this analogy helps, but I heard uh, Christopher West describe it this way one time. Um, it's kind of, <laughs> it's kind of sad, or it's, it's about death. So like my grandpa, uh, it, or okay, maybe I shouldn't say even my grandpa, I should just say an old older person will die in one way or another. Um, he can die naturally according to natural causes, old age, just allowing the, the, the body to die in whatever way it will. Um, or you can do euthanasia, which is our taking and killing grandpa. And there's a big difference. There's the same end result happens that this person died, but there's a huge difference in that one, I deliberately manipulate the situation and, and make it happen. And the other one, we allow it to happen according to nature. And so it's the same way with contraception um, that one is allowing a baby not to be there naturally. And the other one is saying, we're gonna put something, a block, we're not gonna allow this baby to come. Um, so the same end result, but one happens naturally and one happens through artificial. Um, I don't mean to get into a debate here <laughs> and far be it from me to, um, to do so because I'm just um, thinking about things that I have heard, but um, um, this, is, this is my uh, take on things that I've heard from Christopher West in the past few years, but he um, went back on things that he had said in earlier uh, teachings uh, in the uh, series, some of his earlier series, um, he kind of repented, I guess, uh, for kind of being uh, flippant about these things because um, people people really do suffer um, with using um, uh, natural family planning. I have some dear, dear friends, a lot of dear, dear friends <laughs> who've gone the same way my husband and I did using natural family planning and uh, we shouldn't make light of it. It's difficult. Um, it's really difficult. Um, people who have a moderate to large size family suffer. You know, it's the fourth, uh, what do you call it? The, it's part of the marriage ring, the suffering, no doubt about it. You know, um, no doubt about it. Um, my children that have had, that have um, children, you know, I have 12 grandchildren and two who have disabilities. There's no, um, no getting around it. And um, we need to take that into consideration, especially if we're talking to people who are um, doing the best they can as um, Protestants. And um, as far as um, the word grave reasons, which um, people have said, oh, you can't use it except for a grave reason. 
he um, talked about how that was uh, mistranslated. It was uh, gravis, and it's really uh, not necessarily grave reason. People could uh, also talk about that, not necessarily at what we would call an extenuating circumstance being like, wow, it has to be like something really, really, you know, heavy. So each couple really has to de decide on their own. Um, and he did talk about uh, his marriage to Wendy and just, you know, just, just what they decided on their own. I think for my husband and myself, it was especially difficult because I had to take medication for my epilepsy. So we had to take a middle road. Some of it was taking a risk um, and some of it was just saying, you know, abstinence and um, it ain't easy, all I got to say. So I think you have to have a lot of sensitivity if you're gonna try to um, talk about it with anybody. I, I mentioned Protestants, but also Catholics. You know, I grew up in the generation like uh, Ed, you were talking about, you know, Charles Curran was, a, he's, he stood on the steps of, was it, St. Peter's <laughs> or something, you know, shook, practically shook his fist at the Pope, you know, um, it's, it's tough. I mean, there are a lot of priests out there that counsel people. I mean, I was in high school when it happened. Um, we had priests that came into our classroom. We're only like 15, 16 year olds, years old, and they were talking about contraception in a favorable way to uh, 15, 16 year old kids. Um, and it's like, a, you know, roots that have sunk their way very, very deep into the church and people that are in their 80s and 90s who were in childbearing years when this teaching came out in Humanae Vitae. So you think about it, all the priests that have counseled people, um, you know, to, uh, you know, in, an, in, in rebellion against the church. It's very, very deep. And some of them I love very much and they've had big families and they were, they've suffered and they're like, you wouldn't do natural family planning. You know, all they had was at the time was the rhythm method. And it was, it was really tough. Here now there's like, you know, you can use an app on your phone and, you know. So it's... <laughs> It's not as easy as, you know, it's not as cut and dry, I don't think, the, as, as, as we would want to, as we would want it to be, you know. So that's, I think that's why it's important to do the, the why behind the what, because this, we have to take a fresh look at everything all the time and um, think about what we're doing. In the whole in the whole context of it, it's interesting. Um, you know, today's reading about the fig tree. Um, Jesus cursed the fig tree, and um, I was listening to a commentary on it. And uh, somebody said this priest that was giving it said, um, you know, it just seemed like Jesus was in a bad mood when he cursed the fig tree. <laughs> Walked by the, you'll never bear fruit again. Well, it turns out he was, it was in, you know, a season where the, the fig tree wouldn't bear fruit anyway. It was like going past an apple tree in the middle of winter. You wouldn't expect them there to be apples on the tree. But um, Jesus is all about fruitfulness. So, um, you know, be fruitful and multiply. This is, this is what God is all about. So that's all I got to say. Thanks for listening. Okay. Appreciate your uh, um, emphasis on, on sensitivity. I think uh, the, the need uh, for people, though, to hear uh, a context in which they make that decision is extremely important. Because if you come at it with our secular secular values, you know, you're you're going to think of things such as. Uh, college education, which I'm not saying that should be a part of it, 
uh, you're going to be thinking in terms of uh, giving my kids all the things that culture says they should have and stuff like that. And, and I just look at family life now where it's so small and kids have parents hovering over them and they're self-centered. And you look at the large families where the older kids took over responsibilities and stuff and how healthier they are. So it just seems to me that um, we need bold leadership to give uh, young people guidance as to how to make that decision, not to uh, make the decision for them, but not to also just leave them without uh, some insight that's beyond what culture says, you know, should limit number of children you have and such. You know, um, maybe I'm thinking about two of my, my two oldest um, children share an experience. Um, I don't know if um, your family experienced, your, your spouse and you experience, um, but um, anybody else could jump in. But um, if you do practice natural family planning, um, my two oldest um, children who have five and four children at this point. Um, I think it, uh, when you do this and you're open to life, then it opens your heart and it, it's amazing. It like flows into your whole uh, life. It's like a special grace from God to open and you see God's grace flow. It's like, okay, God's going to provide. Um, I totally agree with you, Ed. I mean, our kids didn't get everything they wanted. They paid for a lot of their stuff. They paid for their own clothes. They paid for their own violin lessons. They did da 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 da, -da. But um, we developed a trust in God. And, and I see that in my, my children who have these families. And... Um, they had this amazing experience that my husband and I had. We would be at the, uh, and it's, it blew my mind. I was sitting there at the table uh, at the 2016, I guess, or 2014 TOB conference. And Damon Owens talked about the same experience. He and his wife would be sitting at the table. And I think they, at the time they had six children. And um, my husband and I, my, I can't believe it. Okay. And they would have this feeling there's somebody missing at the table. Somebody is missing. And it was their next child. Somebody is missing at the table. And God planted this desire to have another child. I mean, it was <laughs> it's incredible. <laughs> Somebody's missing at the table. So. Yeah. Well, and Mary, you indicated something that we talked about earlier, that the, the grace that comes from the sacrament of matrimony isn't the uh, just the grace you receive when you receive the sacrament. It's in how you live it out. And that openness to, to fruitfulness is a way to make that grace more abundant. Mm -hmm. when, uh, it's appropriate. Just to touch on the subject. Amen mentioned add on our education so here in Canada Lily we're, we're having trouble can't hear you Lily sorry so um to touch on um Ed's um um point about our education uh here in Canada we have universal uh, education system so we don't have um much of an option to like go into like a Catholic university like you guys have like amazing um, education in America. But uh, I remember in my college experience, I was waiting in my guidance counselor's office and um, like I was expecting, um, like she had a bowl on her desk and I was expecting it to be candy. So I go and grab it. And unfortunately it was like condoms there. Mm. So they had that. Um, and um, so there's like a huge attack on um, on the family and in our, in our church. And um, like comments like uh, from our Holy Father, like um, 
the analogy he used as as like a family similar to that of like rabbits. I don't know if you guys remember um, that analogy he made, but like his point was like, I don't know if he was attacking like like larger families, but like comments like that doesn't really help our generation. And I mean like theology of the body, um, like if there was more um, talks like this over Zoom and just like uh, promoting it through through like the leaders of our church and, and like if they were really worried about our generation, which unfortunately is kind of going like in their back pocket and not they're not really focusing on, on the dangers. Um, so like it's, it's a mess, unfortunately, but um, it's a blessing to have John Paul II's um, teachings and to go back to our, our desert fathers and their teachings and um, to have more people um, having these retreats and stuff it is a total blessing uh, in, in our church. It's a good point. I know we're, we're way over time. We'll just continue to pray for the spread of these teachings um, to more and more people and um you know, to the leaders of the church. I know, I know my experience in, in Catholic uh, university and in seminary was that these teachings haven't been integrated a lot of times into the minds, even of the professors who didn't, who haven't studied uh, these things in depth, or they think they know what it's about. <laughs> um, and uh, so I think there's a lot of work to be done. There's a lot of prayer to be done. Um, so thank you all for coming today. Does anybody have anything else? I'm... Okay. All right, let's close in prayer. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord, we thank you for this day. Thank you for so many blessings. We pray uh, for all marriages, all relationships, uh, for couples that are trying to conceive, for couples who are discerning if if they can um, have another child. We pray for them. We pray for um, anyone who's trying to adopt as well that, for that process. We pray glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, as now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. <clears throat>